am in awe of two mysteries. Why does anything exist, anything at all? And does God exist, some kind of supreme being? Are these two mysteries related? Is the reason why anything at all exists, the reason why there is not nothing, because God exists and because it is impossible for God not to exist? But is the traditional personal God the only kind of supreme being? What else could be a ground of being? Surely there is not nothing. Why God not nothing? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to try to find out. I cannot escape these deep questions of existence. For a lifetime, they have haunted me. Why is there something rather than nothing? Does God exist? To begin, I turn to my old friend, the philosopher John Leslie, editor of The Mystery of Existence, Why Is There Anything at All? Well, maybe one way is to mention five main reactions people could have to the question of existence. And one of them is to say that the idea of a blank instead of the universe is just an absurd idea. Another is to say that absolutely no explanation is needed for why the world exists. A third is to say it's a matter of chance. Another is to say that value is somehow behind the existence of the world. The world exists because it ought to exist. Then some people think that there's mind behind the universe. A mind behind the universe? Many assume this mind is God. So, is God the reason why there is something rather than nothing? I ask a science and religion pioneer, a quantum physicist who became an Anglican priest, John Polkinghorne. John, physicists talk about a theory of everything. Theologians talk about the existence of God. But really, there's a question that's even more fundamental than both of those, and that's, why anything at all? Why is there something rather than absolutely nothing? I think it is a deep question. And interestingly, it's the question that the theological doctrine of creation is really seeking to address. The doctrine of creation isn't concerned with how, simply how things began. It isn't the, answering the question, who lit the blue touch paper of the Big Bang? It is trying to answer the question, why is there something rather than nothing? Why does this world exist? in its character, its fruitfulness, its order, its strangeness, and so on. At the end of the day, though, aren't we dealing with one kind of brute fact or another? Yes. The brute fact of God as having self-existence right. and the brute fact of the material world, the laws of physics, right. as having some kind of brute fact self-existence. Is that what we have, one or the other? Certainly, in Western thinking, those have been the two broad alternatives that have been considered. I do think that a reductive materialism, which says where you're just a collection of atoms and molecules, it doesn't explain a very large number of things about, about, about hum human. It doesn't explain our personal experiences and our experiences of value and, and beauty. And what I'm arguing is that the laws of nature have a character that doesn't make them a satisfactory stopping point in this, this, this Backward, backward argument. But the idea of a self-existent being with divine power and divine purpose, and divine mind, that does seem to me a satisfactory stopping point. A satisfying stopping point. That's what I'd want to explain existence. But here's the problem. What may be satisfying may not be satisfactory. Superstition can be satisfying, but surely not satisfactory. Religion through revelation may be one way of discerning existence, but revelation is a disputed way, reason an undisputed way. How to distinguish between reason and revelation? Can the powers of reason alone, without revelation, address this ultimate question, why is there something rather than nothing? I ask a leading philosopher of metaphysics who believes in God, Peter Van Inwagen. I think I know the answer 
to the question, but the answer that I believe in comes from revealed religion, that God exists necessarily. I think that he has revealed his existence and in fact his necessary existence to human beings. How would you say that scripturally in any, in any sense of whatever, that God's existence not was you know, primordial, everything came from God, those can all be true and God's existence mm -hmm. still not be necessary in a logical sense. Because you notice in the scripture there is no discussion of why God right. uh, exists at all. You could take the blankness of the Bible on this question as saying that the question is somehow illegitimate. But I think the real revelation would occur in the course of the history of the intellectual development of theism. Okay. But the, outside that tradition, however, there remains the fascinating technical question of what can be said about this just by thinking about it, right. that there have been philosophical arguments that would show that it's impossible for there to be nothing. Descartes' ontological argument the modern modal ontological argument. All these purport to prove the existence of a necessary being simply by examining the concept. Then you have the cosmological argument, which attempts to produce uh, the same conclusion, but by reasoning from the existence of contingent beings, the things like us that could fail to exist, if there are things that have this weak grip on existence, this could only be because there's something that has a stronger grip on existence that lends existence to them. Uh, so some versions of the cosmological argument depend on a principle called principle of sufficient reason, that everything has a really satisfying explanation. Everything. Unfortunately, you know, that principle seems to have untoward conclusions. It's not hard to get the conclusion that there is a necessary being out of it, that it's impossible for there to be nothing, but then it's also not hard to get out of the conclusion that everything is necessary, even the position of this table uh, at this moment. Well, naturally, if everything is necessary and something exists, then it's necessary that something exists and it's impossible for there to be nothing. The attack on the principle of sufficient reason says that it is entirely uh, legitimate for everything in the world, but it is not legitimate to talk about the world in its entirety. That's certainly what Kant uh, said about it. Another point is this, it says everything has an explanation, but then just take everything, then all the contingent propositions, conjoin them into one great big proposition, what's the explanation for the truth of that? Well, it can't be some necessary proposition, because a necessarily true proposition can never explain why a contingent proposition is true, and it can't be a contingent proposition because it's in there. Yeah. It would explain itself, and every proposition has to be either necessary or contingent, so you get a contradiction. So, ontological argument, not very hopeful. Cosmological argument, not very hopeful because of the principle of sufficient reason. The question is, can you weaken the principle of sufficient reason in such a way so that it doesn't have really absurd consequences, uh, like every proposition is necessary, but it'll still do some metaphysical work. Now, here's a suggestion. If there's an explanation for things of a certain kind, and it's contingent that there are things of that kind, that explanation has to appeal to something outside that kind. For example, if there's an explanation for the existence of elephants, it has to include some non-elephants. It can't be that the big elephant created all the little elephants because you'd still have the big elephant right. to, uh, to start with. So that maybe, maybe God, maybe atoms, maybe the evolutionary precursors of elephants, something outside the class of elephants has to figure in. Well, now suppose just that it was possible for there to be something. So that means there's some possible world in which there's something. It's going to be true in that possible world that either there are contingent beings or there are no contingent beings, right? Suppose there are no contingent beings. Well, then that, there, there's a being in that world. There's no contingent beings. It must be a necessary being. So it's impossible in that world for there to be nothing. Okay, but then go to the other case. Suppose in, in that world there are contingent beings. Well, then there's an explanation for there being contingent beings. So it's either going to be a necessary truth that there are contingent beings or a contingent truth that there are contingent. Well, if there's a nece that would explain why there are contingent beings if it's a necessary truth in that world. But then it's impossible in that world to be nothing. So uh, it must be true in the actual world that it's impossible for there to be nothing. That, I claim, this argument deduces from just the assumption that it's possible for there to be something. I am enthralled 
But does Peter's possible world argument work? Does it prove the impossibility of there being nothing in our actual world without employing a God who is necessary? Probably, but only given Peter's assumption that it is possible for there to be something. Yet if there really were nothing, then perhaps it would not be possible for there to be something. Peter's personal solution to the why anything at all mystery is that God exists and God is a necessary being. This requires two large assumptions. Because even if God exists, assumption one, why would God's existence have to be necessary, assumption two? Why would it be impossible for God not to exist? I can easily imagine a world in which God does not exist. The tangle of the argument, with or without God, makes some wonder whether the question why anything at all is a legitimate question. I ask another professor of metaphysics, Robin Lepoitvan. It's a perfectly legitimate question to ask, why is there anything at all? Some people have said it's, it's an illegitimate question. Right. It's based on a misunderstanding. I think it's perfectly intelligible. Uh, you and I are what we might call contingent beings. We exist. We might not have existed. I think a lot of the things that we encounter in our everyday lives are similarly contingent things. They might not have existed. The universe as a whole might not have existed. There might have been nothing. So why is there something rather than nothing? Now, we have to be careful how to answer that kind of question. We can't simply help ourselves to the existence of something else. Mm -hmm. And that might seem to rule out an explanation in terms of God, because we're helping ourselves to the idea of an existent thing, God. But God is different, arguably. You and I may be contingent beings. Traditionally, God has been regarded as a necessary being. He could not fail to exist. So if the universe exists because God wills it, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a necessary state of affairs. Um, God couldn't have failed to exist, couldn't have failed to, to bring the universe into that, existence. That's a statement, but is there any substance behind it? Is there any way that you can justify it other than to make the statement that God was a necessary being? Yes, to say that God is a necessary being is something that really, really requires quite a, quite a lot of our unpacking. <laughs> um, uh, so it's, it, it's not the same kind of necessity as uh, the necessity of one plus one is, is two. When we say God is a necessary being, we're not just making a point about language, we're making a point about reality. And here, it, it, it's very difficult to understand how uh, a being can be necessary, uh, can contain the reason for their, their own existence in their own, their own person. Uh, my own view of, of, of divine necessity is to take it not as uh, a property of God, as a feature of our own attitude towards God, that the committed theist um, takes the existence of God as something non-negotiable. Uh, that it underlies everything, it colours uh, their view of the whole of reality. It's necessary in that sense. It tells us more, perhaps, about the nature of belief than it does about the nature of God. If that's the case, though, it's no longer satisfactory to say uh, there's something rather than nothing because God exists of necessity. Robin rejects God's necessity as not solving the mystery of existence. God's necessity is more about language and theistic belief, Robin says, and less about reality and an actual property of God. But without God being necessary in reality, God seems no help in explaining why God not nothing. If only we can apprehend even a hint of God's actual essence. I ask a Catholic philosopher, an expert on God's deep nature, a Jesuit priest, Father Robert Spitzer. Here's a three-step process for future reflection. Step number one. I'm counting. Okay. Uh, step, <laughs> step number one is think of a reality that you can work backwards to. So just say unrestricted okay. and um, okay. uh, no intrinsic, extrinsic uh, restrictions to the power. Then secondly, conceive of that as being unconditioned, that it can exist through itself in a pure unity and pure simplicity. Then the third thing is just 
try, even though you have to approach it from the vantage point of a via negativa, I have to take away every image. I've got to take away the spatial manifold. I've got to take away the temporal manifold. But just think for a second. Every time I'm taking away one of these things that is restricting it, I'm also taking away a presupposition. Now take them all away. Third step. I'll take everything away. Every single thing that can cause a restriction, that is everything then that can cause a presupposition. And at that point, reflectively, where you almost can sort of see for a glimmer of a second something presuppositionless, as presuppositionless as nothing. And if that's the case, all of a sudden the quandary, great quandary that it is, begins to dissipate. And that's why there's room for reality and not just nothing. Perhaps for that glimmer of a second, I can almost imagine God as presuppositionless. No restrictions, pure simplicity, no space, no time. Even so, such a God is not nothing. I still don't see how God could be more simple than absolute nothing. But if this be God, it seems similar to cosmic consciousness, which Eastern religions consider the ground of being. In pursuing why God not nothing, perhaps I should explore other kinds of consciousness, pure consciousness, not just the God kind. I meet a physicist who stresses the deep connection between quantum physics and consciousness, Menes Kafatos. Why is there anything at all? I would ask, answer back, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Science doesn't give answers to the whys. It only gives answers to how. How the particles move, how the fields manifest in space-time, but not the whys. The why is a fundamental philosophical question. And I would say that why there is anything or reality is because perhaps this is a meaningful universe or this is a conscious universe that is there for us to experience all there is. You're giving a reason why, but, but you're using the concept of meaning of justifying the existence of, of anything. But if you, if you don't have anything, you don't have meaning. You don't have anything. If you don't have anything, you have, what I would say, an irrelevant universe or an irrelevant existence. So the universe we live in seems to be meaningful. It seems to be mindful. And it seems to be evolving all the time. Does that justify its existence, though? That is the core, the very core of its existence. Now, justify means I'm stepping out and I'm asking the question, yes. why? Yes. And I would say, you can never step out. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's why the meaning is part of the whole thing. The soup is part so of it. So because we are in the system, yes. in, the, in the reality, we are incapable, you're saying, of, of asking about the reality in its totality. We can ask questions such as that, but how can we address them scientifically or even philosophically? if we cannot extract ourselves from the existence. But if our very existence as conscious being is fundamental, then you can never extract it. It's always there. And so does that give consciousness uh, a, a fundamental uh, self-existence and therefore answer the question of why is there anything at all? It's, does that justify it? It is that? so much the whole thing that you can't ask questions outside of it. You can, but those questions are still in consciousness. Even if you dream of universes that don't exist, they're still in consciousness. <laughs> you, can, you can't get them so out. We, we, so what you're saying, we, we can't escape from consciousness we no matter what we do. And so to ask why is there consciousness in the first place becomes meaningless. Is that It's right? a circular argument. It's a circular question because you can't extract yourself from it. Granted, we only access reality through our consciousness. But does it follow that we cannot evaluate the reality of consciousness? Only, perhaps, if consciousness is the foundation of reality, an extreme position I am not compelled to accept. Where's evidence that the physical world comes from consciousness? 
I am intrigued. I do take consciousness seriously, but I'm skeptical. The physical world seems real enough. I go to a proponent of the primacy of consciousness, the Indian American physician, Deepak Chopra. Deepak, you believe that consciousness is fundamental. Some of my philosophy of religion of, of friends feel that, that God is the ultimate existence. And of course, the quantum physicists believe that quantum physics or something deeper than that, string theory, is the ultimate reality. My question is different. I don't care what your ultimate reality is. Call it what you want. I want to know why there is anything. Why is there something rather than absolutely nothing? I would say there's only nothing. There's nothing else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that what we call things are short-lived qualia experiences in the nothing because qualia, you can't weigh them, you can't measure them, you can't quantify them. Mass and energy are actually qualia experiences in consciousness. There is no something. All things are actually no thing. When you look at anything, you end up with nothing. But there are stuff that you're talking about. You're explaining to me no thing, and, and I agree with you, there's no matter thing. But you mentioned qualia, you have consciousness, you have wave functions. Words, you words, have a lot of words, stuff. words, words, That's words. That's a lot of stuff. Words, but That's if not I ask nothing. you, okay, That's I not ask nothing. you. That's something. Okay, where, you experience the color blue, right? Yes. Where is it? It's, okay, it's, in, uh, it's huh? in uh, imaginary space. <laughs> okay, but does it have weight? Does it have substantiality? No, no, no. You're experiencing sound. Right. Does it have weight substantiality? You're experiencing form. Does it have weight substantiality? The, You're experiencing taste smell. Does it have weight? These are names that we give right. to, I'm using the word qualia because I like it, quality. It's a quality good, it's of a good consciousness, term. But okay? that's, but, but, that, but my point is, a qualia is a kind of something. It's not something you weigh, it's not something you shape, but it's a kind of something. I want to know why there are such things as qualia. Okay, now you've asked a very important question, why is there experience? Yes, why is there experience? Uh, answer is, I don't know. I can ask how, but why? I think no one can answer. Uh, and, you know what? And this is a very interesting I, I point. I would say it's a good amusement park. It's a good theme park. <laughs> it's better than Walt Disney. Yeah. <laughs> I would say it's uh, God's dream. We are dream objects Look, it, in God's consciousness. And, and why are there such things as dreams? Why is there such things as God? Why is there an existent of experience? There's no law that says there has to be, because if there's nothing, there's no law. So, Unless you try to understand nothing, you can't understand any particular thing. Okay, if consciousness is the subjective ground of all experience, yes. then it can only be possible if it differentiates into an observer, a mode of observation, and an object of observation. Just like DNA, you know, your stem cell I, I, differentiates I agree. into this body. I agree, but I'm, I'm okay. not going in a forward direction. I'm going in backward direction. What caused that consciousness to be there in the first place? Is it self-existent? Is there something about consciousness that has a, an intrinsic self-existence so that to ask the question why it exists is a nonsense or a contradiction? Unless you're willing to face this, you really don't understand what's going on. If I cannot answer the question why, which I cannot, not, it compels me into a state of bewilderment. And that bewilderment is a mystical experience that also humbles me yes. into reverence. I, so I, I agree. it's an I agree unanswerable that. question. I luxuriate in bewilderment. That's, that's the true scientist then. That's a radical skeptic. <laughs> <laughs> I stare at the ceiling and wonder, why is there something rather than nothing? Is God or consciousness the reason why there is anything at all? There are other possible reasons, including brute fact, chance, value, even dismissing the question as meaningless or absurd. If God or consciousness is fundamental, it would come in three flavors. One, consciousness as the personal God of Western religions. Two, consciousness as the impersonal cosmic consciousness of Eastern religions. Three, consciousness as a fundamental property of the world. Here's what troubles me. 
nothing existing seems simpler than anything existing. So why not nothing? If there were absolutely nothing, there could be no thing in the nothing, no law, no rule, no existing thing that could bring about something. But because there is something, not nothing, there must be a reason. If we can ever find it, nothing else could be closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.